Good afternoon. We are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We have developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. First, I hope everyone can see the title slide on their computer. A recording of this presentation will be sent to all attendees. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done by using the menu panel in the menu on your screen. Go to view and then select full screen. We do estimate that the main bulk of the presentation will take approximately one hour. There will be an extensive amount of material being covered today. Should we not get to your questions, please send any questions or comments related to this topic to questions at WLL.com. If you like a Road and Sports expert to contact you for a demo, or if you have more questions related to a project, please indicate that in your email. Make sure to include your name, your company, email, phone, and zip code. And now, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Nassif Mahoud received his master's degree in electrical, IT, and computer engineering with a focus on communication engineering from the RWTH Aachen University in Germany in 2014. Since then, he has been working as an application development engineer at the test and measurement company Roden Swartz. In this role, Nassif had the unique opportunity to work with and gain industry insights from some of the biggest companies in multiple industries. He holds multiple patents in the field of satellite, IoT, and automotive testing. Over the years, Nassif has become a trusted advisor for the topic of over-the-air testing and coexisting testings for Road and Swartz as well as their customers. So, without further ado, let's turn our attention to over-the-air testing method for RED, coexistence, and EM interference with Nassif Mahoud. Hello, my name is Nasif Mahmoud. I'm an application engineer at Orange Fods, and I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar on the topic of uh, over-the-air testing for wireless communication uh, devices. Um, today, what we are going to cover is um, relevant for customers who are launching products for the European market. Um, I think people who are not intending to launch product um, in Europe, but uh, in America or uh, uh, Asia Pacific, you will find some of the concepts that we talk about uh, very interesting, and maybe you could uh, use some of the concepts from here in your wireless coexistence tests. Now, um, in Europe, uh, the, the standards are a bit vague when it comes to combined radios and how to qualify them. So in Europe, you do, uh, of course, uh, tests according to RED, uh, but um, they mostly talk about uh, single uh, radios, so single standards. But if you would, uh, you know, put multiple of those standards uh, in the same product, it's, it's not very clear on how to do it. And so we have been uh, contacted by a lot of our customers uh, asking for uh, guidance on, on how to perform these tests, and uh, this is what we want to discuss in today's webinar. So, without uh, wasting more time, let's uh, get into the agenda for today. Uh, so, we're going to start off by discussing the data flow for connected, connected products um, and the ecosystem. Then uh, we are going to talk about different technologies, so wireless connection, uh, communication uh, technologies uh, that uh, this uh, IoT products uh, use. Um, and the corresponding frequencies for these technologies. 
we are going to talk about then the test and measurement side of things. And here uh, we are going to discuss how to qualify bidirectional communication systems. Right. So we're going to take uh, going to take a look at transmitters and how to qualify them and uh, discuss some uh, parameters that we can test for. And of course, we are going to look at the receiver uh, testing side of things and basically put our fo focus on uh, wireless coexistence tests. We are going to uh, discuss uh, the wireless coexistence test in terms of um, different uh, modules uh, that go in a test plan. Uh, in detail, uh, and when we are done with that, we are going to take a look at a concrete uh, use case. Uh, I have uh, made up some examples of uh, uh, automotive uh, infotainment devices, uh, and so you will get a better idea on how we can uh, perform this test. To end of the webinar, we are going to take a look at uh, advanced testing concepts. So we're going to introduce new uh, KPIs in the application layer. So we're going to take we're going to take a look at uh, audio and video uh, as KPIs, and then we are going to try to take advantage of the test setup and routine that we have already set up for uh, the previous um, topics, and then use this um, uh, to perform IP security tests on our communication. So let's take a look at the first uh, slide on um, how the data flow in, in connected uh, ecosystem works. So most of the manufacturers, device manufacturers, they integrate a wireless communication module into their products. And with the help of this wireless communication module, they basically enable this uh, communication to the internet. Now, this wireless communication module, they normally um, support uh, at least one of the air interface technologies like WLAN uh, and in, or Bluetooth. Um, and in some cases, they um, uh, actually support multiple of these uh, standards, right? So the, you would see a lot of uh, the, the cellular communication standards and then non-cellular as we discussed. Now, this communication module would then connect to some kind of server system and then relay the communication back to our screens. And of course, there are different applications. Uh, it depends uh, in which uh, industry segment they fall under. Uh, and, and so uh, we're going to take a look at uh, different um, aspects in terms of applications in a few slides. Now, wireless coexistence is something that affects us over here, uh, completely on the physical layer, right? So this is um, where you have a lot of interference and your receiver or transmitter is basically, uh, or your receiver is, is being affected by the wireless interference signals. Um, and if you have other, you know, wireless uh, nodes around you, you also transmit in a bi-directional communication system. And so you also could, um, you know, hamper their uh, transmissions if you are not, um, you know, uh, sending out um, signals in the, the dedicated frequencies. So if you would have spurious emissions, then of course other services running on different frequencies would also be affected. So this is something that we're going to focus on here, the wireless coexistence issues and the transmitter testing issues here. And the futuristic stuff that, or the advanced uh, testing concepts that we're going to talk about is IP security, which would, which would be somewhere here and the application level testing, which is on this layer, right? So we're going to come to that uh, at the end. Now, the wireless um, communication modules, they are integrated in different uh, product groups. So you would have smart home um, applications of it. So I have listed down some of the applications, so some of the uh, trendy applications that we see in the market and, and we're going to, which are going to become very popular in the coming uh, years. Uh, we of course have a lot of, um, you know, applications in the airspace um, segment. We have a lot of smart city applications uh, that are uh, supporting IoT. Uh, of course, transportation um, is, is a very big, big uh, application area for, for uh, IoT. Uh, IoT. Uh, for medical, um, there are very exciting applications coming up. Um, however, um, this 
is an area which is highly regulated. So if you consider in the US, uh, the NCC 63.27 uh, standard is dedicated to wireless uh, coexistence testing. And so the um, recommendation on how to perform tests and uh, how to categorize risk uh, is all mentioned in this uh, standard. And it, it's uh, a very detailed uh, document uh, and specification that people can follow for the medical uh, area. But uh, there are good um, strategies uh, mentioned there. So maybe there is some uh, things uh, and good practices that can be copied for the entire uh, other industries as well. Uh, then we have um, some applications for smart factories, so industry uh, 4.0 applications, and smart fitness and uh, smart health is another hot uh, application area for IoT and connected products. So uh, why do we want to categorize these things? Because this will become very important in understanding uh, the EM environment. So uh, home appliances would see other interference sources which are um, basically coming from the same um, you know industry area so you will see for um, it's a washing machine you would see smart light as an interference source potential if they're transmitting on the same frequencies and uh, the other stuff so this is something uh, that uh, is uh, important to keep track of now where what are these uh, communication standards or technologies that we talk about for uh, connecting products. So some of the popular ones uh, are of course Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, smart home products, for example, uh, they, they use Zigbee quite a lot. This is a very popular standard for those kind of applications. Applications where data rate uh, requirements are not very high, uh, you would see a lot of this LP1 technology, so sub gigahertz uh, technologies like LoRa and Zigfox. And for uh, mobile applications, uh, you would see some flavor of LTE. Uh, and, and LTE is basically something uh, that is uh, deployed uh, all across the world. So uh, a lot of those uh, applications are supported using this standard. Now to take a more detailed look, of course, um, this Standards are deployed in different regions um, at different frequencies, but uh, what is very common is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, is uh, mostly on 2.4. Wi-Fi, however, has some applications in the upper frequency bands, um, so 5 gigahertz and uh, the likes. Um, you would see the LP1 technologies are mostly sub-gigahertz um, uh, deployment all across the world. So. 868 megahertz band uh, in Europe and in North America 900 uh, megahertz around that range. Um, of course there are some standards like Zigbee for example global uh, deployment frequency is 2.4 however in North America and, and in Europe you would see uh, sub gigahertz. Uh, of course there are some um, regions where uh, LoRa uh, is deployed in um, yeah the 400 megahertz band. Uh, so it is it is very complicated um, uh, to, to pinpoint uh, a frequency for um, testing interferences and stuff. Um, and then the most popular one is perhaps uh, LTE because uh, it's pretty much spread out throughout the frequency spectrum and so you, you always need to take care of this. Right. Um, this was uh, wireless coexistence and the frequencies. Now let's get uh, straight to the test and measurement part where we want to focus, first of all, um, our energies on understanding bi-directional communication. So in bi-directional communication, we are not only receiving uh, packets, but we are also sometimes transmitting data out of our wireless module, right? So. Uh, it is, of course, important to perform um, coexistence tests and to understand how um, we can uh, protect our receivers, how we can maintain uh, and uh, ensure good performance uh, in our uh, receiving capabilities. But uh, we also want to be good neighbors. So uh, with that in mind, we need to test the transmitter performances, right? So some of the common uh, parameters that we can use um, to test is uh, the RF power level of our transmission, so EIPRE. 
then we can test for power density um, and a uh, very popular one is spurious emissions. So this is something that we are going to talk about uh, in the coming sections. Uh, so let's uh, make some progress here to the next slide, which is on understanding different types of coexistence and who does what kind of tests. So uh, chipset manufacturer normally provides this wireless communication modules, right? So they have uh, chipsets that support multiple of these technologies on the same chip. And so they do some kind of uh, conducted tests and they declare uh, conformity uh, in Europe. Uh, that would be the CE certification. So they, they get themselves CE certified on their products and that is uh, uh, what they do. Um, and that's what they promise to their uh, yeah, customers. So what they do is some uh, something that is called in-device coexistence. So it's on the same chipset. So you test for coexistence, but on the same chipset. Now, what you as a device manufacturer or an integrator get is this module, uh, communication module, and then you connect it to your device, right? Uh, and with this device, you cannot start communicating. So what you need is you can uh, then get another antenna module from a different uh, third party supplier, and then you connect these two and integrate them into your uh, product. Now, what you technically did was you changed the original product. Right? You connect it and you created a completely new uh, product. And in some cases, you connect multiple of these um, communication uh, modules to support uh, uh, more of these uh, technologies uh, that we talked about before. And now uh, the CE certification that was already done is no longer valid. So you need to do a new certification on this new product that you just created. So. This is your responsibility and based on the integration. So you have an antenna module uh, and you connect it to your uh, communication modules. Uh, you are definitely going to see a lot more interference sources because uh, yeah, your uh, antenna uh, it depends where you position your antenna uh, is, is basically operating um, in an area with other transmitters. And so you are definitely going to see a lot more interferences from different sources. So depending on the frequency band where you operate, uh, you're going to see uh, interferences from smartphones, smartwatches, uh, Bluetooth headphones, robot vacuum cleaners, and smart lights. Uh, of course, this is an example that is valid for a washing machine um, and not a car. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, uh, yeah, one example that we use. So now, as you can already um, pick up on why this title is called proximity coexistence, uh, is because um, this antenna module is basically picking up interferences from uh, other devices that are located in the proximity of uh, the washing machine, right? So this is why we don't call it in-device coexistence, rather proximity coexistence. And as you can already imagine from the antenna module, that we are no longer capable of doing um, uh, conducted measurements. So we have to do over the air uh, or radiated tests. So this is uh, basically what we are going to focus on in this webinar. Proximity coexistence test, but we're gonna talk about the over the air OTA test concepts. How do we perform uh, coexistence measurements? First of all, we need to create a test plan. And as you can see in this test plan, that it is divided in uh, multiple modules. So the first module is risk assessment, uh, where we determine uh, the, the risk categorization of the device, the technologies that uh, this device is supporting, and the frequencies. Then we have the second module uh, where we uh, understand the intended use case of the product. And so we understand, uh, as we discussed in the previous slide, a washing machine would have interferences from smart um, uh, phones, watches, uh, and the like. So we will have to understand uh, what the interference signal looks like. Um, and then we have the antenna, which we more, uh, integrated in our product. So we have to understand the antenna radiation pattern. So in this case, uh, we have to do a, a new antenna characterization. 
after uh, integrating it into our final product. Uh, and this is also where we are going to discuss uh, the transmitter test because uh, this fits perfectly uh, in our test routine. Uh, the third module is where we determine the functional performance. So we, we determine what the physical layer KPIs are, throughputs, uh, packet error rates, uh, block error rates, that kind of stuff, as well as we talk about application layer KPIs. So this is what we are going to see at the very end of the webinar. But uh, this is something that we should uh, consider this nowadays because a lot of those uh, newer products come with some kind of uh, display system or uh, integrated speaker system. So it does make sense to you know, use um, those um, audio and video quality tests here. Uh, next, we move to the next module, uh, which is the RF environment recreation. Uh, so this is uh, basically where we take the real-world uh, RF uh, scenarios that we just defined in the previous sections, and we recreate that inside the lab. And uh, this and the next few sections are something that we are going to discuss when we uh, do the use case uh, uh, discussion. So for the automotive use case, you're going to see how this works. Right. So. Now let's take a look at the different modules um, in detail. First of all, we need to categorize uh, the different products that we have in different uh, risk tiers, right? So this is a tier-based approach in determining how stringent and what kind of test setups that, or test methodologies that we need to um, qualify our products under. So we are going to uh, see two different uh, test setups uh, in the coming sections, but this is how we do it. In fact, um, in the ANSI C6327 standard for medical, uh, they also uh, explain a tier-based uh, approach uh, in determining risk. Um, so from the left, uh, you see tier four, where it's uh, products which are not very risky. Uh, and uh, as we move towards the right, uh, the products uh, will become uh, categorized as uh, uh, high risk. What does risk mean here. So in this case, risk is, um, so this um, devices, they have some kind of functionality. And if this functionality is hampered or affected because of wireless coexistence, uh, this could mean that the functionality of this device is compromised. And because of this compromised functionality, this could sometimes result in death. Uh, to give you a better example, uh, since you're going to cover automotive, so let's consider automotive. Not all the uh, wireless modules in uh, in a car uh, are actually very risky. So if you consider the the, the Bluetooth and uh, uh, Bluetooth streaming function is not very risky. However, every car has a thing called e-call, so emergency call. In case of uh, an accident, the car can automatically call the emergency services and send your GPS coordinate. Now, if this GPS coordinate is uh, not available at the time of accident because of some kind of coexistence issue, or if the call that is going out using a cellular communication connection uh, is, is for some reason uh, because of a coexistence issue does not go through, this could mean um, very bad news for the user, right? So this is then very risky, and so they are categorized under tier one risk product. Whereas, let's look at something that is very less risky, a uh, washing machine. If you are um, in your office and you want to switch on your uh, washing machine uh, remotely, uh, what you do is uh, you go on your phone and you try to switch it on. In case of uh, coexistence uh, so, uh, or, or interference sources next to the washing machine, the communication does not go through, perhaps. yeah. Uh, this would mean that the washing machine does not start. But the user is not harmed body, uh, so there is no bodily injury to the user, right? In this case, the worst thing that happened was the washing machine perhaps didn't uh, switch on. Uh, you had to come home and then see, okay, your laundry is not done, and then you have to do it manually, maybe. Yes. Uh, so this this is considered as a low risk uh, category product. So tier four to tier one uh, important part is risk increasing this way. So uh, we're gonna so uh, we have to test test these two products a bit different uh, depending uh, on on the risk classification. 
Next, in the risk assessment uh, module, what we have to define is what are those uh, technologies that each of these um, or your device under test supports? Because then um, we can do something called a risk assessment matrix. So let's take an example. Uh, let's say your washing machine. It supports Bluetooth. Your washing machine supports WLAN. Your uh, washing machine supports uh, LTE communication, but it only supports two bands. So the LTE 800 megahertz band and the LTE 2.6 gigahertz band. Yes. Now we want to test first of all for Bluetooth uh, as my wanted uh, signal or the wanted standard. And for this, we can take um, different um, uh, interferer. And to understand which interferers are relevant, because then this would increase the amount of test times and the test points, we do this matrix. So Bluetooth is at 2.4 gigahertz. Is it affected by LTE 800 megahertz communication? Not really. So we can choose to ignore this test completely. Uh, Bluetooth with LTE 2.6 gigahertz. So this I would say is moderate risk because they don't overlap on each other. Uh, so I, yeah, it's 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 nice to do this test. Uh, you could also choose to ignore it. Bluetooth and WLAN. They they basically overlap in terms of frequency. So this is a mandatory test. You have to test for this. If there would be a WLAN uh, hotspot from a smartphone around your washing machine. Uh, of, there are chances, uh, the, the, the probability of coexistence or the likelihood of coexistence is very high. And so definitely, definitely need to test this. And Bluetooth with another Bluetooth transmitter around could easily be um, yeah, interfered. And so this is, of course, another uh, definitely test uh, uh, you know, parameter that we need to include. Right. So. Um, Going into WLAN, so if this is my wanted signal and you have um, once again the same um, configuration, so LT800, not really risky, so ignore. LT2.6, moderate risk, it's upon you. If you want to test it, it's very good. If you say, yeah, I choose to ignore it, uh, also maybe uh, possible. But WLAN with WLAN, of course, of course, test it. And WLAN with a Bluetooth interferer, of course, test it. Now, uh, Choosing what kind of interfere is, of course, uh, an extremely uh, difficult topic, and, and it has been debated uh, a lot uh, by, by experts in the industry. Another uh, um, way of uh, figuring out what interferers you want to take is to, or which frequencies you want to test at, is, is, is placing um, interference signal in the middle of your uh, wanted band, at the edge of your wanted band. Uh, or a, a bit out of your band, uh, so in-band and out-band interferers, and basically change the modulation of your interference signal um, and the power level. So th there are different uh, ways of doing uh, wireless coexistence tests. This is one of the easier approaches uh, by doing a matrix. Uh, this way you, you ensure that uh, you have all the interferers covered, at, at least from uh, the, the frequencies that uh, you have on board. Uh, of course, uh, the other way is also valid, and, and you can basically choose what you want to do. Uh, however, interference, like I said, is a big topic and is a topic for another video, perhaps. Um, the next module is basically intended use, to figure out intended use. So we have different um, products, uh, test objects that we want to test. So we have to understand what uh, RF environment they are exposed to. And so, for example, a patient monitoring device uh, is normally found in a hospital where you would, uh, if you think about it, a lot more uh, interference sources. And so, yes, um, you could consider a lot more, inter uh, so the number of interferers would be much more than uh, perhaps at home. Um, and and uh, on the road, maybe the interference, interference sources are moving very fast. So you could um, choose to use some kind of fading, and you'll see a lot of uh, multipath signals. So these are the things that we have to determine and then define in this uh, uh, area. So home appliances, uh, washing machine, or coffee maker. So you would find this product in the kitchen or the bathroom. So the number of interferers uh, are not going to be as much as uh, in a hospital, right? Uh, and so uh, this is how we um, yeah, determine the 
uh, intended uh, RF environment for home appliances. Uh, car infotainment, for example, cars you drive on the road. You have if you have uh, an EV, you would be at a charging station. Maybe if it's a busy uh, charging station, you would see a lot more. Um, yeah, interferes uh, perhaps uh, all transmitting at the same frequencies. Uh, at factories, at garage, uh, mechanics uh, maybe less uh, interfer interference. Uh, sources are present, uh, and so that's how we can uh, determine what kind of RF environment we want to uh, recreate in, in the lab. Next comes uh, the interference signals. Uh, like I said, it's, it's uh, a very, very difficult topic to uh, just to put a few words on it, but uh, normally the, the, the parameters that are of interest are how wideband modulated signals are this, um, uh, what is the bandwidth of the signal, the power level, uh, and where on the um, frequency spectrum do we find our interference signals based on the intended use cases that we just discussed. The number of uh, interference sources is also important to understand. Uh, antenna radiation pattern uh, and uh, where it is uh, actually located is the next part of our uh, webinar. So here, uh, first of all, uh, we have our device under test set up in a lab. And what we want to do is after figuring out the intended use case, we want to recreate the environment. And so we need to do end-to-end -end network emulation. So we use, in this case, a CMW500 to do an end-to-end -end, um, either cellular or non-cellular network. And uh, we um, basically connect uh, to our device under test. So this is an active communication that is going on. Um, and then what we need to do is we need to do antenna scans uh, in, in spherical fashion with a network analyzer to get uh, antenna radiation patterns, right? So basically this is how we get to qualify the antenna performance in terms of radiation uh, for the coexistence tests. Uh, in the next uh, few few slides, we're gonna see that. Uh, this is how we re-qualify our antenna integration. Right, so this is what we did, radiation, pattern measurement. Now, what we are doing is transmitter uh, tests, right? So now we have an active communication from our radio communication tester with our device under test, which is invisible at the moment, but you will see why in, in a bit. Uh, and what we need to do is we want to test for RF output power, spectral uh, power density, and spurious emission. So what we do is, uh, first of all, uh, because of this uh, integration of antenna into the body of our uh, product, uh, there might be some coupling with the body of, of, let's say, a washing machine. So it's made out of uh, steel or aluminum. Uh, and so uh, you would see some kind of coupling. And so we want to test uh, from all angles, right? And so we want to put it on a turntable and basically spin it around. So in 360 degree, uh, we, we do scans, and uh, at the same time, we measure up to 18 gigahertz on the spectrum analyzer, and basically measure everything that is coming out of our device under test, and we will measure this on the spectrum analyzer. We'll look at it uh, when we do the use case with automotive. Uh, next, uh, when we have our transmitter, uh, performance already determined, and we have the radiation pattern, uh, the, the new radiation pattern uh, tests done, we need to determine the functional performance. So if, let's say, we have a WLAN module, uh, we know that the uh, normal performance, uh, which is acceptable, is as a rule of thumb, is 20% packet error rate. Uh, less than that is, is not good. For if, if we have an LTE uh, communication module, 2% packet error rate is, is kind of like a rule of thumb. After that, the communication goes really bad. Uh, and sometimes we even have uh, call drops. And uh, other KPIs in the physical layer would be uh, data throughput. Uh, so it's, it's quite easy to understand 21 Mbits or uh, if you have a higher, higher speed uh, LTE or, or WLAN communication, you would, of course, understand it. Um, yes, there is, of course, uh, EVM, so error vector magnitude, modulation quality measurement. Uh, this is not very uh, common uh, for wireless coexistence, and uh, 
I would leave it that way, but if it's worth to mention that there is uh, other parameters in the physical layer that could be considered. Um, the next step is to understand application level KPIs, and that would be the video quality. So if the frames are freezing up, uh, in, in uh, especially uh, IP-based communication, you would see buffer signs um, because the videos are preloaded and uh, certain parts of the buffer are preloaded and then uh, when the playback is done, uh, you know, uh, playing that, uh, it goes to the next uh, uh, buffer section which are continuously updated, right? So this is something that we can consider. We are going to see a demonstration for this uh, at the end. Uh, and then audio quality as uh, a KPI as well. So we will see a demonstration for this as well. Uh, worst case scenario. So, um, of course, uh, cell edge is an is, is, uh, area uh, which is uh, uh, very sus susceptible for uh, wireless interferences. So, this is something that we need to understand uh, what is uh, the, the worst case scenario for LTE communication for our device or for WLAN or, or Bluetooth. And, uh, yeah, interference sources we need to understand uh, for worst case. And uh, next we go into uh, test setups for Tier 3 and Tier 4 uh, products. Uh, so this is Tier 3 and Tier 4 risk uh, categorization, as we saw a few slides before. And here what we have is a CMW500 um, that is basically uh, connected to a power amplifier. And this is how you provide uh, the wanted signal. So for network emulation uh, to our device under test. Using our SMW that we discussed uh, in the, actually we didn't discuss this in the previous slide. So the SMW is uh, the interference signal generator. With this, we can generate any form of uh, interference signals. Uh, irrelevant of bandwidth, so you can uh, on the fly generate uh, cellular standards like LTE, 5G, 3G, uh, as well as non-cellular standards like uh, WLAN, Bluetooth, as well as uh, LP-WAN technologies, or you can uh, provide a custom digital uh, modulated uh, signal if you want. Uh, and it is very easy to, to control the frequency at which you want to put this interference, uh, the, the bandwidth, the power level, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, or, or different types of modulations as well. What we also have is uh, the spectrum analyzer uh, for spectrum monitoring. So this is a mandatory part. Uh, so you want to monitor what happens in the RF spectrum at all times. Uh, we also have this uh, inspection software uh, that we will discuss in a bit, but just to give you uh, an idea why we have it is because of the application layer KPIs that we want to monitor and measure. Another important thing is that we have uh, used a shielded chamber in this test setup. So this uh, shielded chamber uh, basically blocks out all RF signals coming from the outside, um, and we are going to take a look at uh, the, the uh, products that we have uh, on display here at the very end and discuss them a bit more. So this is a test setup that we use for uh, Tier 3 and Tier 4 um, ca risk categorization for performing wireless coexistence using all the uh, information that we discussed before, as well as the radiation, uh, the transmitter um, properties that we measured uh, in the previous section. Now for higher risk products, um, of course here is something that we uh, depicted uh, for, for medical device, but it could also be um, used uh, and repurposed for other risky products, right? So this is just an illustration, but let's put our focus on this side. Um, higher risk products need to be tested a bit more stringently, so we use uh, uh, more interference sources. Uh, and in fact, here what we have is an uh, in, uh, interference station with up to eight interferers, right? We have one SMW with multiple of this SGT uh, vector signal gen generators, all connected, all calibrated to uh, give out up to eight interference signals. We have the WLAN um, 
oh, sorry, the, the, the wanted signal coming out of our CMW500, of course, we can um, use a power amplifier to boost up the signal uh, if required. However, for medical uh, products, um, the, the picture as it depicts, sometimes you don't need to uh, provide a wanted signal. Sometimes you just want to be providing a lot of interference signals, high-powered interference signals, uh, to check if the, the, the devices are still performing. And uh, so you could optionally switch this off, take it out. Um, if you need higher power in your interference signal, you can, of course, connect it to a power amplifier and drive it. But this is a test approach uh, for a Tier 1 and Tier 2 coexistence tests. Uh, our focus is, of course, on this side, and this side has to be always configured according to need. Right. Spectrum monitoring, as we mentioned, is, is always mandatory, so that is always there. Um, and the advice software. So we did mention advice quite a few times, uh, and we are going to go to it later. So uh, uh, use case that we have prepared is automotive. So let's break down what's going on here. So let's say this is the car you are sitting in, and you are playing Spotify uh, on the Bluetooth uh, radio system uh, using the speaker system of the car. And this car, let's say, has uh, integrated antennas um, in the front bumper, back bumper, uh, has a roof antenna, shark fin antenna on the roof, and uh, some other antennas on the glasses. And also integrated um, embedded antennas on the WLAN and the Bluetooth module inside the car. Of course, uh, you are sitting in a red light. Uh, and then comes next to you is another bus with a very fully uh, crowded bus, which is giving off a hotspot, a WLAN hotspot inside the bus, and the people inside uh, the bus are also listening to their uh, music on their Bluetooth uh, headphones and a lot of uh, interference sources over there. Uh, since we're at a red light, people are also crossing the road and they have smartphones, a bit too big here in the diagram, um, which is also transmitting uh, yeah, a lot of different signals, and they also have a dog with the pet tracker. So this is the RF environment that this car is seeing. Um, and of course, uh, we need to be able to, first of all, uh, do the intended use case uh, and, and uh, uh, risk assessments. Uh, and after we are done with this, we need to perform the transmitter test, right? So first of all, what we do is uh, follow the steps chamber calibration, measurement steps, and result documentation. But let's take a look at the things that we discussed already in the previous section. Uh, we want to be measuring the radiation pattern of the car, so what is coming out of the car. So we connect this car to the infrastructure uh, or um, a network using the CMW500. And now we have an active communication going on. Um, the RX. So the receive antenna, which goes to our spectrum analyzer, is uh, connected here, which is also connected to a switch matrix because we will do this scan um, in multiple steps, in multiple subbands. So 500 to 1 gigahertz, 1 gigahertz to 3 gigahertz, and uh, or uh, 4 gigahertz, and 4 gigahertz to 18 gigahertz. And uh, what we are also going to do is, um, in the first step, lift up the car a little bit because then um, we have a uh, network analyzer and we can do some kind of antenna scans like we saw in, in, in the previous slides and, and basically get a feel of the antenna radiation patterns. Next, we are just going to place the car and then uh, do this 360 degree spins and we are going to measure uh, different, um, yeah, uh, spurious emissions and, and, and transmissions that goes out of the car. This is uh, looking like this when we do the measurements. So from 500 to 1 gigahertz, uh, it is very stable. But uh, we did mention uh, an LTE, trans we did have an LTE transmission at 800 uh, megahertz, as you can see here, um, some GSM uh, transmissions as well from the car. Uh, in the second subband, from uh, 1 to 3 gigahertz, we have Bluetooth and uh, WLAN transmission. So we can see here, 
and in the upper band, uh, of course, uh, from uh, uh, four, or in this case, we did it from three because the subband ended there. From three to 18 gigahertz, uh, there is no transmission going on in our communication modules, and so nothing came out, uh, of course, uh, in those frequencies. Now, this were uh, the transmission uh, transmitter tests. Now let's let's uh, move to coexistence test. Uh, according to the diagram where we are standing, uh, or the picture where we are standing at the traffic light, uh, we saw that there were a lot of interference sources. So we want to be able to position the interference sources uh, where uh, the antennas are integrated in the car. So it's basically interference sources will be picked up by antennas outside of the car where the antennas are mounted on the, the bumpers or the uh, glass antenna or the roof. And then inside the car, passengers can also bring in uh, their devices, which are also transmitting. So uh, we need to be able to position those uh, interferers inside the car as well. Now, the CMW500 uh, provides uh, for network uh, emulation, so end-to-end -end network emulation for cellular and non-cellular, and that is what we do here as well. And the SMW200A basically uh, is used as a vector signal generator, but to generate interference signals for all these kinds of uh, standards. Now, uh, a step further is where we monitor the entire thing from our uh, spectrum analyzer, right? So what we have here is a wanted signal is uh, the WLAN. So we are using basically this setup to first of all connect to a WLAN uh, access point. And what we are doing is introducing a Bluetooth signal. So it's a one megahertz Bluetooth signal at the middle of the band. And in the second uh, diagram, we are using the same WLAN uh, communication, but in this case, uh, the interference signal we will use instead of the Bluetooth um, uh, w, uh, uh, LTE communication. And this is what it looks like. So we have, uh, first of all, in this region, no interferers. So this Bluetooth uh, is switched off. And this is just a normal throughput uh, measurement. So we are sending um, 1,000 packets. So I, I did mention we, we do end-to-end -end communication. So we are sending, it's kind of like sending from a server uh, 1,000 packets, and we measure how many of these packets are lost. So this is where you will get how many packets are lost. And at the first, uh, yeah, up to far first, let's say 700 uh, packets, there was no interferers, and then we switch on the interferer, so the Bluetooth interferer, uh, according to the picture that we saw before, uh, uh, with a power of minus 30 dBm, uh, we see a lot more packets being lost. And then uh, over the entire transmission of 1,000 packets, we have lost 150 uh, of them. And so this is basically where we test the uh, uh, the packet error rate. So this is 15% PER. Uh, what else can we say about this? So that the modulation scheme of the uh, LTE, uh, oh, sorry, the, the WLAN communication was uh, QAM. This is another thing that we need to ta uh, take in consideration, that we need to be using uh, the, the uh, higher order modulations um, that are available to this uh, device under test, because uh, testing at the lower order modulations uh, communication uh, system, so if we used QPSK, uh, of course that would be a much more stable connection and we wouldn't see so many of the interference signals, but uh, all our devices are programmed uh, to get the best data rates, right? So they would use higher order modulation schemes, and so it makes sense to use the maximum uh, modulation um, scheme that is supported on your device under test. Uh, in the second case, we used an LTE uh, interferer. So once again, uh, we sent some packets. In this case, instead of 1,000, we used uh, 2,000 packets. And we used the LTE uh, as an interference uh, signal. And we 
change the power. So we increase the power in steps. And you could see, uh, you can see that uh, the, the packet error rate is increasing gradually. Every time we have uh, switched up the power of our interference signal, you would see that the packet error rate is slowly uh, increasing. And of course, uh, at uh, minus 22 uh, dBm power uh, interference, you would have a very high steep uh, jump in packet error rate. So the total uh, average packet error rate uh, over this 2000 packet transmission was 19.5%. Uh, Here, once again, we used uh, uh, 16 qualm uh, modulation scheme because this was the maximum that was supported on our device under test. Now, advanced concepts. So uh, we did mention that uh, we are using um, advice inspection software to monitor um, the video and audio performances. So for advice, we use off-the-shelf uh, HD webcam and a microphone to, to monitor the video quality and uh, uh, audio quality um, of, of our uh, device under test. And here we have uh, set up an example. We have a smartphone which is connected to a streaming server uh, over a WLAN connection. And uh, this smartphone is also uh, playing Bluetooth audio on a loudspeaker. And this is something that the CMW can already do uh, because uh, this is this active connection that we uh, set up. And the CMW has a um, um, streaming server as well where we can put in videos. And that is what we did. Uh, our focus is on the interferences, right? So right now what we want to uh, simulate is what if an uh, unwanted signal came into this band and uh, this we can uh, replicate with uh, SMW providing um, an interference signal on the same frequency. And this is what it looks like. First of all, what we have here is uh, audio being streamed onto my device under test. And you see it's a smooth video. What we uh, play is a, a, a time-coded video signal, uh, which we put on our streaming server and our uh, device under test is uh, using the WLAM connection to stream it. And this is what it looks like when we switch on the interference. A uh, few things going on here. Um, as you can see at the bottom here, this is uh, on the advice software, a capture. And every time there is a frame freeze, it can recognize the time uh, stamps and uh, time coded stamps. And then it can recognize if the frame is freezing or not. Of course, this uh, uh, buffer sign is uh, because of the preload, so that the data rate fell down when there was interference. So the d data rate decreased and uh, the, the loading uh, of the buffer is not as fast anymore. So it, uh, the, the playback is playing certain parts of the video and then uh, it, it pauses to load uh, the next uh, part of the buffer. So this is uh, what it looks like uh, smooth and uh, yeah, uh, this is something that we can measure with the advice and you'll get uh, the report on, on the reporting tool of uh, the software. Next, uh, we have this uh, Bluetooth communication going on and here we introduce an interference. How do we do it? We use another antenna uh, from the SMW and uh, basically uh, put uh, an interference signal on that same frequency, around 2.4 gigahertz, and this is what it's sounds like. But for this, I'm going to switch off first the laser pointer. Right. So, so the first part is uh, where you listen to uh, white noise that we are sending from the phone to the Bluetooth speaker. So it was pretty smooth. Um, and then uh, we switched on interferers. And so you could uh, hear uh, some some disruption in the audio tone, but if we take a look on the frequency and and, and power um, axis, this is my signal in green, and we have set up some upper limit and lower limit for what is uh, acceptable performance, and then we switch on um, uh, the the interferer, and you see that sometimes this uh, 
frequency uh, is is uh, at certain frequencies the power level is is going and uh, going over the the acceptable limits and so we can detect this and and uh, basically uh, put it on the reporting tool so once again let ta let's take a listen sorry So this this is uh, with and without interference. Now, um, IP security. We already connected uh, the CMW to our product, and now we can uh, use the IP security test uh, personality to basically see where my device is connecting. So we can see different applications that are being run uh, in the background. Uh, different uh, domain names, uh, different connection groups. So you can see different connection uh, details such as uh, the type of connection, uh, data statistics, and uh, geolocation of the server that you're connecting to. Uh, you could also choose to have the connection results displayed like this. So my device under test was connecting to some servers in the US and uh, mostly in Europe. So this is something that uh, you could imagine as uh, IP security uh, that we can uh, do in parallel while doing the coexistence tests and uh, transmission. Right, with that, we are almost at the end. So what we um, used uh, for our coexistence tests are interference signal generators, so vector signal generators from Roland Schwartz, such as the SMW200A, which can deliver up to two interference source out of the box, up to six gigahertz. And then you can combine with SGTs um, to basically um, increase the number of uh, coexistence um, uh, interference sources. And um, yeah, we can uh, go up to 40 gigahertz, but then we use different uh, connections and uh, different uh, combinations of instruments. We have seen monitoring, um, uh, for monitoring purposes, the advice software uh, and the spectrum analyzers uh, from Rode and Schwartz. Uh, for uh, antenna measurements as well as uh, calibration, we can use uh, network analyzers from Rode and Schwartz. We have uh, portable uh, uh, radio shielded chambers. Uh, such as the DST is perfect for uh, applications uh, up to 6 gigahertz for a device with a smaller form factor. For network emulation, we have the CMW500 that we used for cellular and non-cellular communication. But if we are going to do uh, coexistent uh, network emulations for uh, 5G communication, then we would need to use our new CMX500 uh, um, radio communication tester. And uh, for battery performance, which is a big topic for uh, IoT, uh, we have a bunch of our oscilloscopes, uh, we have power probes and power supply. Right. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you would like to um, know more about wireless coexistence testing, you can, of course, visit our website. Or uh, yeah, feel free to email me your questions as well. Um, my email address is mahmoud.nasif at rodeminashwads.com. Thank you for your attention. Wow, thank you. This was a very informative presentation. Um, everyone will receive a copy of the recorded presentation, the PDF slides, and certificate of attendance. I would like to remind everyone to please send any questions or comments related to this topic to questions at WLL.com. If you'd like a Roden Swartz expert to contact you for a demo or if you have more questions related to a project, please indicate that in your email. Make sure to include your name, the company, email, phone, and zip code. Our thanks go to Nasif Mahoud excuse me, for taking time out to enlighten us about over-the-air testing methods for red coexistence in EM interference. Our next upcoming webinar is covering ground bounce on June 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. If you haven't already done so, 
make sure you visit our website to register for this webinar if you're interested. On behalf of the Washington Labs Academy and Roden Swartz, we would like to thank you all for attending. And now I will end the event. Everyone enjoy the rest of your day and please be safe. Thank you.